A television show premiered at the end of the 1990s and stands out as a series that would go on to blur the lines between both good and evil. The show's pitch was, a mobster goes to therapy. The series, of course, is David Chase's The Sopranos. The Sopranos follows the life of Tony Soprano, the newly appointed boss of the North Jersey crime family. Within the premiere of the series, we witness our protagonist nurturing a family of ducks, attending his very first therapy appointment, and also chasing down a man who owes him money just to physically assault him. This blending of good and evil that we see in The Sopranos would go on to inspire new shows for decades to come. Characters such as Walter White of Breaking Bad, Dexter Morgan of Dexter, and Don Draper of Mad Men all stand on the shoulders of Tony Soprano. With that being said, we're going to take a look at The Sopranos Iceberg today. Now, if you're not familiar with icebergs, here's a quick rundown for you. An iceberg is a series of ideas or facts about a particular game, movie, or a TV show. All of these theories start out at the sky level, which means that these facts are well-known, confirmed, things that everybody knows about. As you progress downward into the depths of the sea, these theories become more ominous, often having little evidence in coming from analyzing particular pieces of media. So with that being said, let's jump right in. Tony Sirico was a real gangster. This is, in fact, true. Tony Sirico, who plays Polly Walnuts in the series, does in fact have quite the rap sheet. Before becoming an actor, he was a known shakedown artist. After a dispute with a disco owner, Sirico once warned, quote, I'm going to come back here and carve my initials in your forehead. You better learn a lesson and you better show me the respect I deserve. A Bellevue Hospital psychiatric report from that period concluded that Sirico suffered from a character disorder. I also learned from listening to the Talking Sopranos podcast that this is why Paulie is always seated with his hands shown on his chest. This is to show others around him that he does not have a weapon in his hands so as to not present a threat. Lorraine Bracco was asked to play Tony's wife, Carmela. This one is also true. According to Lorraine Bracco, the role of Carmela Soprano was too similar to the mobster wife role she had already played in The Goodfellas. She told the Huffington Post, quote, I fell in love with David the minute I met him. When I walked into the room, I said, I like this guy. And I said, look, I don't think I should play Carmela because I did. I did it in a Scorsese movie and I got an Oscar nomination. I really don't think I'm going to bring so much to this for you that I haven't done already. And in my opinion, this is in fact true. Lorraine Bracco as Dr. Melfi is one of the best characters of the entire series and really gives people an insight into Tony's mind. Steve Shrippa wore a fat suit to play Bobby Bacala. This one's also true. In fact, Steven wasn't the only one wearing a fat suit for filming. Denise Barino Quinn, who played Ginny Sacramano, also wore a fat suit. And of course, if you've watched the show, you know that the weight of these two characters is often ridiculed and even becomes a point of tension between the families. The Bada Bing was a real strip club. This one's partially true. While the Bada Bing itself doesn't exist as an actual club per se, filming was in fact done on location in New Jersey at a club called Satin Dolls. Another deviation from reality is the fact that in New Jersey, being topless and offering dances is illegal in an establishment that also sells alcohol. Which, of course, if you've watched the show, you would know that the ladies of the Bada Bing are often bearing all to see. Level 2. James Gandolfini was often contacted by the Mafia. According to Michael Imperioli, who plays Christopher Moltisanti, this is true. While not necessarily offering advice to James Gandolfini, the Mafia did give him a little edict on the dress code of a Don. Not only that, but this little note about a dress code for a Don also comes up in the show. Outside of that, not really a lot of contact between James Gandolfini and the Mafia that I could find, just this one anecdote from the Seth Meyers interview. Silvio Dante was a character written by Steven Van Zant. In case you didn't know, Steven Van Zant, who plays Silvio Dante on the show, was part of a little-known band, as well as being on one of the biggest TV shows of the century. 
Anyways, the closest I could find to this is some information about who Little Stevie was originally going to play. David Chase actually had Steven audition for the role of Tony Soprano, but instead, David Chase wrote the character of Silvio just so that Little Stevie could play the role. Ghosts exist in The Sopranos. While I think this is a fun theory, I would mostly disagree with it. Of course, there are many supernatural things that come up throughout the show, such as Polly's interactions with ghosts, Polly's own superstitions, dream sequences, illusions. However, these are mostly just storytelling devices as far as I can tell. Level 3. David Chase only directed the first and last episode of The Sopranos. Yes, according to The Sopranos wiki, David Chase only directed the first and last episodes of The Sopranos, which makes sense as these are arguably some of the most pivotal in the series. However, David Chase was still working on many episodes in different ways throughout the show. Tony killed in the finale just like The Godfather. This is, of course, one of the most hotly debated points of the show, that being the ending and the finale. Fans have always argued and been pretty passionate about their own ideas regarding the show's ending. I include myself amongst those who believe that Tony is in fact killed, and there are several hints at this throughout the final season. If this video does get enough attention, I'd love to dedicate a whole video to that idea. This item on the iceberg refers to the pivotal hit in the first act of The Godfather, in which Michael Corleone pulls out a revolver in the bathroom of a restaurant and then performs a hit before fleeing to Italy. Of course, the ending of The Sopranos is very similar in that Tony and his family are seated in the diner, and a man is in fact seen going into a nearby bathroom and coming back out. However, we don't get the privilege of seeing what exactly happens on camera. But again, I'd love to make a whole other video about that if there's enough interest. Level 4. The hit on Adrian is inspired by the real-life murder of Teresa Ferrara. There are some similarities between the character Adriana and mob mistress Teresa Ferrara. Both were partners with high-ranking mobsters, both had become informants to the FBI, and both were later murdered by their associates. The cat was Adriana reincarnated. In the later seasons of the show, Polly is frustrated at the sight of a cat who can't seem to stop staring at a picture of Christopher. There is a point in the show where Adriana also has a cat song, and yes, it is weird that this particular cat wants to look at Chrissy, but overall I think it's more just a play on Polly's superstitions that we see throughout the show. The first three seasons show the Twin Towers during the theme song. Yes, the first three seasons indeed do show the Twin Towers as Lorraine Bracco's credit comes on the screen. Later on in season four, which premiered after 9-11, this is replaced with some generic footage of an industrial area that we used to see the Twin Towers on. Level 5. David Chase's Backup Plan This theory states that David Chase had a backup plan to make The Sopranos into a movie if the show had not been picked up by HBO. However, according to a Screen Rant article, the truth is the opposite. David Chase had originally wanted The Sopranos to be a movie, and then pivoted to making it a show at the direction of his manager, but just because the characters that were written for the movie were so meaningful and needed to be fleshed out more. Karen's ghost is at Bobby Bacala's dinner table. When Bobby and Janice sit down to eat the forbidden ziti, it appears that Janice's wine glass moves, and this kind of gave into the idea that the ghost of Bobby's late wife is present at the table. Maybe she was coming back for revenge for eating that ziti. However, if you actually watch the scene, the truth is much more simple. The wine glass that moves is placed on top of Janice's placemat, so when she prepares to eat, it gives the illusion that the wine glass is actually moving towards her. Sorry. Level 6. The viewers are collectively whacked by the mafia at the end. Really, this is just another theory about the ending of the show. In reality, it's kind of on the same level as the whole Rugrats are in limbo theory for Nickelodeon's The Rugrats. Again, I'd love to dedicate a whole video to my opinion of the ending based on what comes up in the show rather than theories created outside of the show like this one. Altan Dagli, or The Turkish Sopranos. 
I apologize to any Turkish friends out there if I mispronounce that. But yes, there is in fact a Turkish television show with some odd similarities to The Sopranos. The description from the IMDb page, which by the way has a fantastic review rating, says, quote, There is a mafia man named the President on the series. Ekrem Altandagli lives with his wife and children. His family life is restless. Nariman, an old and grumpy mother, constantly raises trouble. His uncle, a mafia boss like himself, is like a nightmare with Payadar. Problems do not leave behind. I'm sure this is somewhat poorly translated, but what really adds a cherry to the top of this cake is the fact that David Chase is listed as the creator of the show on IMDb, which to my knowledge, David Chase did not create this show. Level 7. Vito Jr. really stepped in real poop in the shower scene. I couldn't find anything to substantiate this theory. Yes, this poop does look pretty convincing in the scene, and yes, it would be hilarious if this was in fact the case, but I highly doubt it. Let's move on. Polly is the head of the New Jersey family after the finale. I found a very interesting article I've linked below if you want to read more about this, but in short... This is a theory that Polly is the one who inherits the head position of the Jersey family after Tony Soprano is killed in the finale. Now, of course, there is some tension between Polly and Tony, including when Tony almost killed Polly. But this interesting article that I found, which I've linked below if you want to read, essentially talks about how in the episode The Blue Comet, when the Lupertasi family is discussing a plan to attack the Jersey family, they mentioned only three targets, Tony, Silvio, and Bobby. Someone even asks if Polly is included, and it's confirmed he wouldn't be. But why? Why exclude Polly from being killed if he's one of the top people in Tony's crew? Again, it'd be really cool to lay this all out in its own video if there's enough interest, so let's move on for now. Valerie killed Tony. In what's arguably one of the best episodes of the show, Pine Barrens, Valerie's an attempted target of Christopher and Polly. Of course, if you've seen the episode, you would know that Valerie escapes this killing and Chris and Polly are left stranded in the woods. This theory is more or less suggesting that he could be the potential suspect for killing Tony, but again, I would disagree and lean more towards the gentleman in the members-only jacket that we see. But maybe we'll get to cover all that in another video. Well, if you're still here, thank you so much for watching. This is one of my first videos and what I'm hoping will be Manny for this YouTube channel. We'll possibly cover The Sopranos, other TV shows, and maybe a little bit of gaming as well. Again, I'd like the next video to focus on the finale of the series as it's one of the most discussed parts of The Sopranos. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe for future content. And also feel free to comment below as I'd love to hear some feedback.